All right, today we're going to learn about medieval Europe. We have four daily objectives. Number one, explain the role of the Catholic Church in medieval Europe. Number two, explain what led to the invention of feudalism. Number three, define the manor system. And number four, list key innovations made by Europeans during the Middle Ages. All right, so we talked about the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Remember, the Roman Empire had been split in half. Western Roman Empire is going to collapse about 476 CE. Um, the Eastern Roman Empire is going to last another approximately 1,000 years under the, until they're eventually conquered by the Ottomans. These are all the different barbarian groups, Vandals, Huns, Ostrogoths, etc., that destroy the Western Roman Empire and eventually are going to settle these areas. So the collapse of the Roman Empire in Western Europe is what's going to usher in the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages last approximately 500 to 1500 CE. So the Middle Ages is this period between 500 and 1500 CE. A new society emerges based on three factors. The heritage of Rome, so the laws that were left over, the roads left over, that kind of thing. Catholicism, so the Catholic Church, and customs of various Germanic tribes. So the Catholic Church, these guys are the original Christians. So there are still Catholics. There may be watch, Catholics watching this video right now. Um, Catholics are the original Christian. At this point in history, if you were Christian, you were also Catholic, which is just about everybody in Western Europe. So the Catholic Church to this day uh, has a head theological figure known as the Pope. And the Pope, so this is the guy in charge of the Catholic Church, he lives in the city of Rome. Western Roman Empire is gone, but he still lives in the city of Rome. And he provides order, security, and a common identity for Europe. So even though you live in the kingdom of the Visigoths or the kingdom of the Franks or in modern-day England, uh, you still are Catholic, so you have something uh, in common with everybody else. Now, Latin, remember this is the language of the Romans, is going to mix with the various different Germanic languages, uh, for example, in the kingdom of the Visigoths or the kingdom of the Franks, and they're going to create whole new languages. So in the kingdom of the Visigoths, this is eventually going to become Spanish when Visigothic combines with Latin. Um, the kingdom of the Franks, uh, Frankish is going to combine with Latin to make French. You also get Romanian over here in the east. Uh, why it's called Romanian? Because it's Roman. Um, so you get lots of new languages uh, pop up. There are some Latin words in English, but not very many. Most of our words come from Germanic over here and never actually mixed with Latin. So the most important Germanic people are the Franks. Um, this is also one of the barbarian groups that helped destroy Rome. Uh, they are going to settle in modern-day France and Switzerland, and they are ruled by this guy. His name is Clovis. In 496 CE, about to suffer a defeat on the battlefield, Clovis came up with this crazy idea. He decided that he was going to pray to the Christian god for victory, and he won. He and 3,000 of his warriors were baptized shortly thereafter, and this begins an alliance between the Catholic Church, which supported Clovis's invasions, and the Franks. It was also the beginning of Catholicism's dealing in temporal affairs. So for the first time, the Catholic Church doesn't just care about religion. It's going to start caring about law and land and politics and money, too. And this is very, very, very important. So eventually Clovis is going to die, and one of his descendants is going to be this guy called Charlemagne. This is Charlemagne. So Charlemagne is going to grow the Frankish Empire a lot. You can see its borders here. Um, he actually gets very close to reuniting the Western Roman Empire. Not quite. He doesn't take Spain back, um, but he does get close. He even conquers the city of Rome. Um, he gets crowned, this weird title, um, known as the Holy Roman Emperor, even though he wasn't the Roman Emperor. But he gets crowned that by the Pope um, because he goes and rescues his buddy, the Pope, uh, after the Pope got attacked by a mob. This is a turning point in European history because for the first time, a religious figure in European history, the Pope, claims the right to crown a secular prince. So basically, from now on, if you're going to be the king of an important country, you get crowned by the Pope. This is a big deal because the Pope can say no. And this event is going to signal the joining of Germanic power under the Franks and Charlemagne, the Catholic Church, and the heritage of Rome all into one thing, which is ultimately going to turn into Western Europe, which we're going to spend a lot of this class talking about. Ultimately, Charlemagne's Frankish Empire is going to be destroyed by external invasions. Those invasions are Muslims in the south, Magyars from the east, and Vikings from the north. So Muslims actually at this point in history conquer almost all of Spain, which is a big deal. Um, Magyars are coming in from the east, attacking modern-day Germany, and Vikings are coming from the north and raiding. Let's talk a little bit more about Vikings. So Vikings originally come from Scandinavia, which is modern-day Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. 
um, which is a very cold and wooded region. Uh, Vikings are pagans, so they're non-Christian. They worship warlike gods like Thor, if you've seen the movies. Um, the really cool thing about the Vikings are their boats. So they have these sh uh, very shallow bottom boats that enable them to both travel on oceans and up rivers and lakes. Um, so they could literally jump in their boat, cross the ocean to like England, for example, and then go up the rivers in England, attack the cities. Nobody ever even saw them coming. Um, very, very scary guys. Uh, mostly they were looking for gold and slaves. So they would attack a city or even a church, um, take all the gold, take some slaves, go back home. Good times. So Europe is under constant invasion. Vikings in the north, Muslims from the south, Magyars from the east. Everybody is super scared. Everybody is super scared. What people learn, the average guy, the peasant, what they learned is that the king couldn't protect him. He was too far away in Paris or in London. He couldn't protect him. They were getting destroyed by Vikings, Magyars, and Muslims. So they started relying more and more on the local nobility, so the, lo the local important guys. Maybe the richest guys, maybe the guys with the most soldiers. They start relying on these guys more and more and more for their protection. And this is ultimately going to lead to the creation of feudalism. So here's what feudalism is. The king, in theory, the king owns the whole country. So to this day, England is actually a monarchy, so they have a queen, Queen Elizabeth. And technically, Queen Elizabeth owns all of England. So in feudalism, the king or queen is going to give land to the nobles. These are the lords, the nobles. And these guys are known as vassals. So the nobles are vassals to the king. So in exchange for land, the nobles are going to provide the king money and soldiers. Pretty simple. Now, the nobles are going to have knights work for them. These are the soldiers. They're going to have knights work for them. Those are the guys who enforce the will of the nobles and therefore the will of the king. And then under the knights, we have the serfs. We actually have peasants and serfs. There is a difference. So these guys are going to work for the lords on their manners, which we'll talk about in just a second. And basically the way it works is the king provides land to the lords, who provide land and castles to the knights, who provide protections to the peasants and the serfs, Peasants and the serf provide food and money to the knights, who provide food and money to the lords, who provide food and money to the kings. That's feudalism, in a nutshell. So like any other hierarchy, feudalism does take a pyramid shape and status to determine a person's prestige and power. So the higher up you are, basically the more important you are. Um, status is almost always inherited from parents in the system. So the next king is going to be the king's son. The next Noble is going to be the noble son. If you were born, if your dad's a peasant, you're going to be a peasant, that kind of thing. Now, serfs are a special kind of peasant. They are landless peasants. So you have some peasants who like own their own little farms or whatever. But you also have serfs, and serfs don't have any land at all, and they're super scared. So what do they do? They go and they talk to the knights and the nobles, and they're like, hey, I'll make you a deal. Let me work your land, and in exchange you'll protect me, and I'll get to keep some of the food so I don't starve to death. And they say, cool. So serfs are not slaves. They could not be bought or sold, but they are attached to the land. So whoever owns that land also has serfs that come with that land. Um, everything the serf makes or grows or whatever technically goes to the nobles and the knights. So this is not a very fair system. Realize like 95% of people are down here. This is very few people. Um, and these guys are getting the lion's share of the rewards of these guys' work. So if feudalism is the basic political system of medieval Europe, the manor system is going to be the basic economic system of medieval Europe. So here's the way the manor works. This is a, kind of like a manor. This is like your little castle or keep. This is where the noble or the knight or whoever is going to live. He lives here. Now here is the town. A lot of the peasants and serfs are going to live here. You've also got your blacksmith here, maybe a hotel, maybe like a couple stores and groceries and stuff. You've got your church in here. Around that, you've got a wall. You've also got a moat in here, which is kind of cool. And around this, you have all of your farmland. So if you're a serf, you're provided housing, farmland, and protection by your noble or knight. And in exchange, you give him everything you make. Um, serfs rarely ever leave their manor. They normally leave, never left 25 square miles of where they were born. Um, everything you need to survive is produced on the manor. Clothing, food, religion, your spouse, everything comes from here. So these are like little self-contained um, 
places to live. They're not countries, um, but they're kind of similar. They're totally working within themselves. You got about 15 to 30 families live in a village on the manor. Um, the only things that really were not produced on the manor were salt and iron because that's not available everywhere. But generally speaking, everything one needed to survive was made on the manor. Let's talk about knights. Knights are a very important innovation. They're originally copied by Muslim from, from the Muslims, I'm sorry, from Muslims um, in Spain. And they're created by this guy named Charles Martel. This is probably your idea of a knight, and this is actually pretty close to what they look like. Um, basically, you got a horse. Horse is very important because it makes you go fast. You're wearing heavy armor. So if you get shot by an arrow or something, it doesn't matter. You've got something that never, nobody ever remembers is the stirrups. Stirrups are things, these things that you put your feet into, kind of like on a bicycle, that allow you to hold yourself into the horse. And then you've got the lance. So basically, the horse is going really fast. You're on top of the horse. And because the horse is fast, you can hold on with stirrups. And you use your lance. And you hit that into some guy. And then you kill him. That's the knight. It all works because of the horse, the stirrup, and the heavy armor, and the lance. That's your knight. Stirrups were actually invented in Asia around 200 BCE, but eventually did make it to Europe by the 700s, so just in time for the knights to be invented. Nobles granted land to knights in exchange for service, but we talked about that in feudalism. And there's also this thing called the Code of Chivalry, which you probably remember, but it's basically this thing that says this is the way the knights are supposed to act and talk and breathe, and nobody ever followed it. That, that's pretty much it. Um, if you want to talk about a knight's training, basically the sons of nobles became knights. So if you're the eldest son of a noble, you get to become the next noble. But like, let's say you're the second son of a noble, you don't get anything. Generally, the second and third and fourth and fifth and so on sons. These are the guys that are going to become knights. Um, at seven years old, you actually start out your knight career as a page. Basically, you start working for a knight, um, shining his armor, helping him dress, that kind of thing. At 14 years old, um, a page becomes a squire. Uh, these guys are actually going into battle with their knight, but they're mostly just helping them prep, prep their knights for battle. Squires and pages, they wait on their knights, they practice fighting skills. And at 21, a squire finally becomes a knight. The only way to become a knight is for another knight to make you a knight. Most new knights generally travel a year or two to gain some experience before finding a noble that they can pledge their allegiance to um, and then start working for in exchange for land and money and that kind of thing. The last innovation we need to talk about is the castle. Um, so we talked about the constant invasions, uh, the constant invasions by the Va Va uh, Vikings, Magyars, and Muslims. Well, eventually, those the manor that I showed you before, eventually that's going to start getting bigger and bigger and bigger and turn into castles. Um, unlike other constructions of the time, if you want to think back to the wall that you saw in that manor, castles are built of stone with really high walls. The idea is keep people out. Um, the purpose of a castle is very simple. It's to sustain sieges. Um, a siege is just when somebody is trying to break into your castle or break into your town or whatever. So the idea is you hole up in your castle and you hide and you've got lots of food and water in here and you've got guys on the, in the parapets, these towers, um, shooting arrows down and survive against the invasions. It's pretty simple. You probably know what a castle is. Take a couple minutes, answer your four daily objectives.